Hey, everybody, what's up? It's your boy, MJ. Welcome to the Black Wine Guy Experience. My guest today is the proprietor of Wayfarer Vineyard, Cleo Paulmeyer. Uh, raised in Napa, Cleo is the daughter of legendary vintner Jason Paulmeyer. Uh, she would move east to attend the University of Virginia, where she received her BA in art history, and she would go on to earn a master's degree in connoisseurship of fine and decorative art at Sotheby's Institute of Art in London. And in 2008, she returned home to work closely with her father to learn every aspect of the family business. And in 2017, she was appointed president of Paul Meyer. Welcome, Cleo. Thank you. Happy to be here. I'm so glad you're here. Um, we're trying a little wine. You brought some wines. Um, tell everybody what we're, 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 we're day drinking on. Yeah, well, we're getting started um, with our uh, Wayfair WF2 Chardonnay. So all the wines we make are just from our one vineyard, um, and um, you know we're we're make, we're trying to make wines at the highest level from our from our one site. But inevitably there'll be barrels that just don't quite make the cut mm -hmm. um, for the for the you know Wayfair label, and so um, but so the wines are still delicious. You know they've been farmed in our by us in our vineyard, made by us in our winery. And um, they're just not, just don't have quite what we're looking for for the Wayfair label. So um, we take them and bottle those barrels under um, the second label. We just started it in 2019. And, um, and so that's uh, the WF2. So this is the, the Chardonnay. Very nice. Very yeah. nice. Very nice. Well, we'll get to the next wine, I'm sure, as we're conversating, <laughs> which isn't really a word. Um, <clears throat> um, so let's start at the beginning. Um, I know you were raised. Are you from Napa originally? Were you born in Napa? Where are you born in San Francisco? Okay. And then, um, and then when I was a toddler, my parents decided to live in Spain for a year. Oh wow! So, actually, I, my first language because it was right when I was, you know, starting to speak was Spanish. But then, of course, I've spent the rest of my life in Spanish classes. <laughs> 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 lost, lost that sadly. Um, I just at one point my mother told me because my mother spoke Spanish and she just said you just um came up to me and just said stop talking to me that way <laughs> you just refused to continue speaking Spanish I had just started you know school like you know kindergarten back in Napa because then we moved back to Napa mm -hmm. when I was about four or okay. five years old and um and was in, like immediately an outsider because I just I didn't well I spoke Spanish not English and so apparently then I just refused to continue speaking it Sadly, yeah. <laughs> Super interesting. So, um, why did you? Why did your parents move this? Why they want? I mean, that's freaking amazing. But like, why move to Spain with a young child? Yeah, yeah. Well, so well, two young children actually. Me, my brother and me. Um, they uh, just well, my, my dad loved wine. They loved to travel. Okay. Um, my mother. Um, well, as I mentioned, she she speaks Spanish, but she is really into languages. She's an um, had a career as an interpreter and translator. Mm. So she spoke Spanish and French. Um, and um, and so they just, they're just kind of, you know, young, always been young at heart. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I just wanted to live in Spain for years. So we lived up in northern Spain and the San Sebastian region, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I mean, arguably the best cuisine in all of Spain. And so, yeah, and so they, so they just um, did that for a year. My dad... His first foray into the wine business was actually importing some Spanish wine, and so, um, so that was part of it too. Um, and then they moved back to, to California, and uh, and back to Napa. Now, <clears throat> um, was like your dad from Napa? Was someone from? He was Napa? from Oakland. He was from Oakland. Yeah, okay. so, so Bay Area. Bay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And and um, like what? Is it like being raised in Napa? Because, like you said, you're like you, you were like an outsider because you were speaking Spanish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, these days, you, I mean, there's plenty of children that enter school. Well, I was gonna say, I was, I, I was gonna say, like, like you or know, you're in the wine classrooms. business. You're in the wine business. Like you, you, that Spanish could come in pretty handy. I know, but, anyway. but that would have been awesome if those schools were around yeah. then, because then I could have the dual you know, immersion schools. You know, yeah. the, so what a, what a blessing to be raised bilingual yeah but, oh well um <laughs> uh you know so being raised in nap i think i think it's like a lot of kids is that you you're just kind of jaded right if you grew up there and you just or at least well i guess i'll just speak for myself um 
you know, just don't really appreciate what you have. And, you know, Napa was not what it is now, um, yeah. you know, um, a few decades ago. Um, th- you know, there were far less traffic lights. It was just sort of like a podunk little town. Um I mean, maybe not Podunk, but, you know, the downtown area would flood every few years. And so, you know, businesses struggled. Um, They since did a you know big project down there. So now we don't have that issue anymore. But um, and, you know, and so, you know, grew up, my dad um, would it was it was always kind of like a family joke, but also not not really a joke because my dad, whenever we would like drive to go camping or something like that. Every time we would see a tasting room, which back then there were far fewer tasting rooms, right. and they were just little like people would put their sign out on the street or along the highway, and you pull over and walk in, and um, and so whenever my dad saw like a tasting room sign, like some between where like our you know wherever we started and where our destination, he'd like pull over, and be like, oh, like, let's make a pit stop here, and we'd be like, no, dad, not another tasting, and you know, because we'd just be in there, uh, just sort of lolling about there were no ipads like we just had to entertain ourselves while (laughs) dad dad, like did the yeah did the tasting and then we you know went on our continued on our merry way but yeah i mean like for yeah going going to work with dad was um either had to be really quiet in the house or in the car while he was on phone calls (laughs) (laughs) which of course he like always had to take like right in the living room and he'd be like shh like i'm on the phone (laughs) um or you know um in, in wine cellars, um, when he was in wine cellars meeting with winemakers, or um, out in the vineyards when he'd be, you know, pulling berry samples and things like that. So, um, in retrospect, I was pretty charmed. Um, but, you know, I never thought that I would follow in his footsteps. I always thought I would live in New York or DC and um, and not move b- and not be back in California. Yeah. 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 So, you, you said your, your dad's first foray into the wine business. Um, was importing some wines from Spain. Um, I was curious, what was what did he do? Like you said, your mother was a translator. Mm-hmm. What did your dad do that you guys could even go live in Spain for you? Like, like. Well, he was a lawyer, okay. but um, th- 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 well, he he has his um his father probably gave him a little bit too much money than he should have. <laughs> 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 My dad did not bring me up like that. <laughs> Um, but, um, you know, he had some, so, he had so, some family so, so, money. So he, some family. so he was a lawyer. Was your grandfather also a lawyer? Was he, was it? My grandfather was, um, no, um, no, he started out in Wisconsin. Okay. Um, I don't know what generation immigrated, but, um, uh, they had settled in Wisconsin and so, but my grandfather was decided, you know, married my grandmother and then moved out to Oakland area. Okay. Um, and he started, um, as a tire salesman and, um, and at that time you would sell tires at gas stations to gas stations. And so then he started, um, buying, they were called service stations. When service. You, when, when, that's when right. Hence sold. the tires. Yeah. There you go. Um, and when they used to pump gas, for yeah, you, they used to pump gas for you. Yeah. That was the best. Clean your windows. It was the best. Yeah. I, Air I, was for free for your time. One of my things I like most in life is putting gas in the car. <laughs> it's just, I find it very tiresome. But anyways. Um, Move the, to New Jersey. You can't pump your own gas. Yeah, or <laughs> Oregon, yeah. right? Or get an electric car. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so anyways, my, my grandfather um, started then um, investing in um, these gas station properties. And so he would buy the land lease it to, um, you know, like Exxon or Chevron. And then, um, and so then these little, you know, inexpensive corners ended up becoming major Mm -hmm. highway intersections and valuable properties. And so, so that's what my, that's my grandfather. um, That's what he did. And uh, yeah, really self-made man. Yeah. I love that. Where did, where, where did his family and where did your family immigrate from? Um, Well, that part of my family from like Germany, but my mother always said like Wales, but basically I'm just sort of everything Northern Europe. Northern Europe. <laughs> <laughs> we don't. I mean, it's. I mean, again, yeah, Europe's great, but uh, nothing, nothing super exciting there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I, just, I love the stories of people like of immigrants like come and and like you know who's selling tires and like and he's like wait. Yeah, we had a, he had a dream. He was like, I, right. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to California. Yeah. Like he just wanted to. I think that's really cool. 
and then literally came came to California with nothing, and um, and did that. So I think that's really yeah. No, that's that's supersonic. So it, 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 it informed. And I don't. And I didn't mean to like you know speak down about what my dad did, but he had money and no. And listen, then, and so he and my mom were like, let's go to Europe. So and like I said, when you asked me if I if I um win the when lottery, I'm yeah. gonna. Yeah. <laughs> I said I'm gonna go to Europe for a year. So yeah. my yeah my husband and I have similar uh, dream. Yeah. yeah. No, it's totally cool, and I, I think I you know it. Uh, these parts of the story, like it's the wine business. So like, you know, obviously you're in it. You know the expression, how do you make a small fortune in the wine business? You start with a large yeah. one, right? Like, so <laughs> so I, I always like to be, I, 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 I'm I someone who believes in, I love wine and it's an amazing beverage and I love the business. I love the people in it, but mm-hmm. people need to understand like, um, there, when people say, why aren't there more of this? I'm like, because it takes money. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know I mean? Well, when my dad was starting Paul Meyer, he, it's, he didn't, he started with a small fortune, you know, and created something really, you know, it, right. he didn't start with a, like that, like that yeah. famous joke. Yeah. Um, but, but I think, but I think that a big reason for that is because of his timing, you know, in the eighties, it was a completely different valley, completely yep. different place yep. and a completely different landscape for the industry yep. then than it is today. Yep. And, in, in you know, you could, and that's true across in, you know, across industries, um, you know, and so it makes it a lot more difficult for people to enter the market or compete, smaller people to compete sure. in the market. But, um, but yeah, you know, his, his timing was, was good. Yeah. And, and, and timing is so important. And also just that, that like, there's nothing wrong with your grandfather, Giving his son some money because he worked hard for it, right? So I always tell people like, let's, let's like people judge. We we're all judging each other, no matter where we're on the stratum. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Um, but I think that's cool. And you know, I went to law school. That's what you do if you really don't want to do anything. You could look impressive because you say. Yeah, you're a I just think it's funny because then my dad ended up raising me and my brothers, diff- a little differently. Yeah. But <laughs> but I think it's for the best. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah. So. Let's speak about that. So you, you're you back in Napa. You're in kindergarten. Don't talk Spanish to me. Um, <laughs> and did, was your dad immediately, uh, was was he, did he start in the wine business when he came back to Napa? Yeah, yeah. So so he, well, he practiced as an attorney for, okay. you know, for many years. And before my parents were in, um, went to Spain, they were living in D.C. before they had children. And my mm-hmm. dad was practicing law. My mother was working as an interpreter and translator. And so... So they started their careers and then had kids okay. late. So, so they were doing other things. Um, and um, uh, so, so when my dad got started in the wine industry, he he had met um, some people through tasting groups. So when he was in law school, he started, um, you know, tasting wine obsessively and started his own tasting group. Where did he go to law school? I just looked because I was. I, I was uh, like, Golden Gate University, I believe. Oh, just just yeah. Abu Kali. nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, and uh, and I think he got like a master's or something at Georgetown. I'm, I'm trying to remember. Uh, but yeah, probably got his LLM. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, okay. um, anyways, and so um, and so he partnered up, um, and um, his first venture in Napa Valley was to plant a vineyard in Coombsville. Okay. Um, and so um, he did that with his partner who um, smuggled in uh, the vine cuttings from um, from Bordeaux. Um, and so, yeah. Because I love that. It's before TSA pre-check and all this stuff. Oh, yeah. People just shoving yeah. vine cuttings down their pants. But, yeah, there you go. Um, where are they purported to be from? I'm just curious. Um, they, well, they they got them from nurseries. Oh, okay. In, um, oh, so, okay. So in, they, in Bordeaux. All right. So mm-hmm. they didn't. Yeah, they, no, it wasn't like they weren't clipping um, you they, know, vines. They, they didn't do it, the DRC thing that someone yeah. Well, I think Yeah, I think, well, that's way more common in Burgundy. Yeah. But in Bordeaux, I guess they, they were just, um, you know, they my dad knew or he knew from all the research he had done, the wines he had tasted, that to make really great wine, you weren't gonna, you weren't going to get it from the colonial selections that they had available. It's your, you know, UC Davis nursery, and yeah. so that's what they wanted. Okay, the Bordeaux super yeah. cool. Okay, so what, what, like, what, what years? And Coombsville, that's like, he must have been a pioneer in there because that's now just becoming a known region. If you're reading the, you know, the certainly, the, yeah, yeah. So it was, um, so it was, um, 
uh, Caldwell Vineyard, so in in Coombsville, and so my dad's partner was John Caldwell, who smuggled the uh, the vine cuttings, and um, and so and so it's it's a pretty large vineyard, um, all like pretty steep hillside, um, and yeah, and there and to that at that point, I believe there was really only Chardonnay planted there. Nobody thought that you could plant good Cabernet um, in in that in that area. They thought it was too cold, but mm. um, of course. Um, you know, they were, that's now proven wrong because uh, there's some fabulous Cabernet um, vineyards, and of course, you know the what what my dad was doing with those with the with that fruit back in the '80s. Um, of course, you know, global warming has also helped. Yeah, I know, <laughs> a I know. Bit, I said, no, it's, thanks. Yeah. I tell people like, oh my God, they're making so much better wine in New York State. I'm like, global warming. Yeah. Why is Riesling dry? Global warming. Mm-hmm. I mean, the wines are amazing coming out of places like. The Rieslings are the they're, they're, they're truck and they're so dry, right? But yeah. like, why are they dry? Um, yeah. So we have to. Uh, um, so it's the eighties. Your dad's got really good timing, um, and um, always was Paul Meyer. Was that was that was always the name? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So well, so his dream was to make his own Mouton, and so um, he fell in love with Bordeaux wines, and so um, yeah, so he started Paul Meyer. Um, first vintage was eighty six. Um, Randy Dunn was our was the first winemaker. Randy Dunn. And then um, Randy at Dunn. Yeah, and then mm. and then Helen Turley um, after him, and then that's Helen with Helen Turley is where um, my dad's venture into Pinot Noir started. We're gonna get there. We're gonna yeah. get to Helen. Yeah. But before we go there, so like, um, and it was primarily Bordeaux stuff, right? I mean, when Randy made it, was, it, was he making Cab? Was there any? Blends in there was it was it was it blended or was it one hundred percent Cabernet Sauvignon? Yeah, so it was always um, a Bordeaux blend. Okay. So um, and that was and that was ha- driven also by you know him, him wanting to make like his own mouton. So a Bordeaux mm-hmm. a Bordeaux style blend, um, and so it, it's it's uh, Paul Meyer has always been um, you know Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot Cabernet Franc Petit Verdot and Malbec. Yeah. Yeah. And when when did they um, when did he start getting the the big scores was that during helen's it was right off the bat right off the bat yeah okay. yeah so it was kind of he was um you know kind of off to the races yeah. with, with the first vintage um you know robert parker mm-hmm. was a huge um you know becoming very influential mm-hmm. was very influential at that point and um you know and and paul meyer was really one of those brands that that caught that wave yeah yeah and so um how old are you when this is like kind of going on? Um, like uh, early eighties. Uh, you know, mid eighties. Yeah. I was um, like just I don't know, five years old. Oh, yeah, yeah you're a baby. So, as you're getting older and you're going to school in Napa, and like, what's the deal? Is like, is there like, there must be like, like what, like what's the school system like in Napa, right? Like, I mean, it's got to be different. It's not. I mean, it's not that. That you know, I mean, obviously, well, it's different from going to school like somewhere here in New York, yeah. but it's it's just it's okay. pretty regular. So community. you were you were, but yeah. you were probably in school with a bunch of people whose families made wine or own vineyards. I mean, or not a, necessarily. A number, no? no, not really. I mean, yes, like there were definitely some people, but um, I went to I went to public school, okay, and um, and uh, yeah. So um, you know, my dad loved to. Um, my dad's always been really flashy, uh, like big personality, and he um, and he really he coll- collected um, old Cadillacs, like oh, fifty nine, nice. and he had one in particular. It was a pink Cadillac convertible with like big fins, like the because over the the different years the cars were made, um, the fins were smaller or bigger. But this is like the big fins, these like f- like flame shaped like tail lights. <laughs> And I was always so embarrassed when my dad would pick me up at school in this like flashy. I mean, it's, it's a you know an old cat. Like it's not like it was some, you know, like really like modern sports car or something like that. But <laughs> it was, anyways, yeah, I, I didn't like to stand out in that way. Hey, was your father a pimp? <laughs> right? Yeah, like, like right. Pulling up in a pink Cadillac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um. So. Um, you get out of high school and you're like, I'm out of here. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, I asked my um, dad if I could go to boarding school 
Okay. I I don't know. I was a very precocious 12 year old. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so starting at like, so it's kind of very much like a college process yeah. um, to, to apply for a boarding school, but then ended up uh, age 13 going to boarding school in, um, in Delaware. Oh, um, okay. And it was a, it was a great experience. Yeah. I really love that. So I was kind of like, I'm out starting. Oh, wow. So like, <laughs> like, 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 Cause I, <laughs> we're going to get into it, but like literally that's, Amazing. You said, can I go to boarding school? Because I think um, if you can do it, it's incredible because you it's your college experience. You, you're, 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 you grow up. You're away from home yeah. at 13. Yeah. And it was a great school. I mean, it was – and it wasn't like this snobby elitist it wasn't like, place. It wasn't like you know, short Rosemary Hall. Yeah. Like that. It yeah. was a St. Andrew's school, yeah. um, and I can't speak to – I mean, it was – gorgeous campus it was where dead poet society was filmed that okay. movie with robin I'm williams nice. Nice. i mean it was very nice but the the culture of the school at least when i went there was like if you like talked about money or where you summer or who your family is or whatever that was Not looked cool. down upon yeah. that was 100 percent looked down upon and um the school has a you know huge endowment gives out a ton of financial aid and so my experience, even, you know, I went to boarding school. I, I didn't go to school with a bunch of, you know, like billionaires kids. Yeah. 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 So it was, um, it was great. I loved it. Nice. Nice. So, um, then from there you went to the university of Virginia. Yep. Yep. Um, were, were mom and dad disappointed at first that you weren't coming home, or they, are they, they at that point they knew she was. Like, My dad definitely wanted me to go to school in California, um, and, and made me apply to California schools. I don't think I, I think I kind of fudged up my applications a little <laughs> bit. I, I definitely did not put the same effort into those right. as I did some of the others. But, <laughs> um, but my yeah, my mom had already been living on the East Coast for um, a few years, so okay. she was thrilled. Um, and uh, yeah, so I went uh, went to UVA and kind of but kind of got there and didn't. I was sort of like you know I just applied to it like any other school, but I didn't know all the things about it like all the lingo and like what our school mascot was or like <laughs> like what our football record was or basketball season last year. Like I didn't know any of this. I was just like here I am to go to school, and so um, but it, that was also a really great experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an amazing. Uh University, yeah, one of the greatest in the country. Um, what was it? Art history? Yeah. Just um, well, my dad s- said, you know, you really should apply for the business school undergraduate program, and my mother said you should just follow, do what you are passionate about, and so I obviously followed my mother's advice, and um, and decided to, after taking an art history one hundred and one class, you know it. Um, schools, uh, you know, great schools that like a lot of the classes that like the 101 classes that you take have some of the best professors in the school. Um, and you know, there's hundreds of kids in the class, but, um, but the, so anyways, I took one of those 101 classes and, um, uh, just fell, fell in love with it. So, so I started, um, yeah, so I got an art history degree. What is, what, what, what is, what is what does that look like? Because I, I see that, um, like, what, like literally, like after the one on one, what's like art history two on one? Like what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there's lots of different periods of art, but um, you know, and, and so you study. So you know, you have to study from ancient art, you know, through more more modern um, decades. But I mean, it's it's essentially you know just the study of history through okay. the art, um, the study of history and cultures, through the art that it's produced and, you know, in, in mm. society and, and how the art reflects the society and things like that. So, mm-hmm. um, And, like, typically, like, you have a BA in art history. What, is, what do people usually do? We'll get to your grad school, but what do people do? You go work at a museum? Like, what do you... Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, what, what, like, yeah, what, like... Well, we got, you know, I got to the my last year of college and my friends, some of my friends were starting to go to job fairs and things like that. And I just, and I was like kind of caught a little off guard. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit, <laughs> what am I going to do next? And so, um, and so 
well, I thought, well, it would be great to, you know, b go abroad for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so I found a program that uh, some, another friend of mine had done um, that, that graduated from UVA before me um, in London. And so, so that program was to study, um, it's basically taught you how to look at a piece of art or an object um, or furniture that, um, that is unknown and then to, and then skills to determine what it is and like who the art, who the uh, artist might be or the the maker, what um, you know year it's from, so on and so forth. Sounds like blind wine tasting. Yeah, there you go, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so um, and so and then I at the same time I also walk, worked in worked in an auction house. Um, so okay. So that's um, you know, but I kind of quickly learned that to. Be to stay in the art world in was was much more of an academic pursuit than mm -hmm. a business one, mm -hmm. and um, you know going back to when my dad was encouraging me to take the undergraduate business degree because I, I had always I had always envisioned myself um, in the business world doing something with business mm -hmm. is not so much a academics and then also you kind of look you kind of a good way to determine like what your um, career is going to look like is when you, if you, you know, interning somewhere, your entry level position somewhere, look around to like who is there and how long have they been there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. and in the art world, certainly there's a whole lot of underpaid, highly educated people uh -huh. that are, like you know, the wine world. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That well, are waiting for, <laughs> you know, that like person who's held that position for decades oh to move on yeah. so that then there can be that one opening. And so, I just didn't see, um, I didn't see myself in that world anymore, or that or that future for for my career. And so, um, so then, so I, uh, I decided to you know kind of veer off into a different direction when I and I moved back to um, San Francisco. All right, before San Francisco, yeah, London. So mm -hmm. I get master's degree, connoisseurship of fine and decorative art. What, when we're talking about that, like, is this, that sounds to me, I don't know, like, you're curating stuff. I don't know. Like, what, what, what is like the concert? Because that's a fascinating degree. Um, so, well, I think you just made the perfect analogy. It's like blind tasting in mm -hmm. wine. Um, and actually, I've never thought of it that for, before, but it's, it's perfect. I mean, I'm going to steal that now. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, Every, all my guests leave a free one. You're yeah, welcome. Yeah, it's so, you know, it's basically you are an expert in a particular mm -hmm. field mm -hmm. of art. And so, you know, you and so you can assess not um, not just like what this art, art object is, but also the quality um, and um, and, you know, and, and, and the, you know, advise clients or identify objects mm -hmm. or price them for auctions, um, you know, work in a museum, th mm -hmm. things like that. What was it like living in London? London is, um, you know, I haven't been to London, but I understand it's like, it's a pretty dope city. It is cool, it is cool. It's definitely a city where there's, I, I mean, it was expensive yeah. to live there. And yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's like, to, like, to really uh, enjoy it, you definitely have to, you know, have be able, be able to spend some money and that wasn't necessarily the budget that I was on yeah. but um <laughs> but um you know I, I very much um enjoyed living there. I mean I just love a city I just love the energy of it I love coming to New York mm -hmm. um and so in in London is is very much the same very yeah nice, very nice um you know what I think London is a is a good place to take a break um because we're going to talk about you coming back to San Francisco so we'll be right back everybody with more Cleo Okay, Cleo. Awesome. You, 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 you loved London town, but uh, you know, it's like it's like I tell people, I'm like, yeah, why don't you live in New York? I was like, because I can't live in New York. Like, if I'm living in New York, I want to live in New York, right? Like, my house would cost like 1.5 million dollars in New York and be half the size. Yeah. <laughs> So, yep. so <laughs> that's why I don't live in New York. But if I could live in New York, shit, come on, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, so, um, did you actually work at Sotheby's? It was school. Did you have like a, a position there in the auction house, or did so, it kind of set so, you up with so something like that? So the school was um, affiliated with Sotheby's. Okay. 
but um, I worked at Bonham's Auctioneers okay. while I was there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and so I was just um, wor- working working the auctions. So, just you know, no intern t- stuff. T- tell people like what's that? What's like? Because I've done some wine auction stuff, but like art auctions have to be in London have to be ludicrous. I mean, it, like it's, the, like the wealth that comes to buy art at a freaking auction. Must yeah. Be, I mean, they don't have major auctions every day right. of the week, but you know, on you know a weekly basis, there'd be you know be auctions for all sorts of various things, and you know just to like just to be around these things, you know, with just paintings stacked against the wall, and you know cataloging everything, and um, and then and then the you know the excitement of running the auction, um, it, you know, it, it's cool. It, it's a it's a fun, um, uh, it's a really cool thing to be around. Nice. So you came back to San Francisco. What 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 did you do when you landed in San Francisco? Again? Um. So I, you know, floundered for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Not gonna lie. And then um, eventually um, landed a, a position at William Sonoma Corporate. Oh, okay. Which was really great. You know, around the time that I was when I was in London, I had started to think about eventually joining um, my dad in the mm-hmm. family business. Um, but he thought, and I thought, and I agreed that it was, would be important for me to continue to have some other experience, um, before, you know, jumping into the family business. So, um, so for a few years I worked, um, for William Sonoma corporate and, um, and it was a, it was a great, it was a great, uh, experience, you know, got to experience being part of a really large company Mm -hmm. like that and all of the, um, you know, the bureaucracy and the, you know, the, the way the organization is run and the structure. And so, um, so it was, it was a good experience. Um, and, uh, around 2000 or in 2008 was, um, was when, um, I started, I actually got an email from my stepmother and she was asking if I had any friends that were looking for an entry level position, wanting to get into the wine business. (laughs) And, um, and I was at that point, I was like, well, you know, like, maybe this is this is the my opportunity so um so i applied for the job <laughs> and uh and then started um and then started working um with my dad uh later that year so so um entry level so kind of walk us through that like when did you start did you did, like did you first of all let me back up did you ever do any harvest stuff when when you were growing up, or no, never harvest okay. stuff. Um, well, there might have been like a brief stint, you know, counting irrigation lines in the vineyard um, okay. and then <laughs> <laughs> washing barrels at the winery. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, but I was answering the phones, um, doing you know administrative Admin things, stuff, yeah. um, entering orders, um, you know, work. Um, Reconciling inventory, things like that. Okay. Yeah. So you come on board, and what did your entry level position like? Did you like, uh, like what month was that? Did you come in in time to do a harvest, or did you have to wait like nine months? Like what was? Um, no, I I came in um just on on like sale on the sales side. I was I was a sales assistant um to or assistant to the national sales manager, Mm -hmm. and so um so I didn't um so I did not work work harvest, but. Now in retrospect, I'm I'm always like we get around to another harvest and I'm like I am gonna be the harvest intern this year like I'm just gonna do it but I'm no, always you're not. but I'm always so well I've got my ob- obligations with my children that's what I'm course, saying at this but point, then, you know so I'm like I missed my my window I should have been a harvest intern then but you know I had I had work to do at the at the at the office so <laughs> <laughs> they were just gonna let me frolic in the winery for a few months but. So what was what was what was that like coming home? Uh, because you you mentioned coming home could be hard, mm-hmm. you know. Like, but what was it like? Now you're back in Napa, and you're working in your family business. Yeah. So um, it was. I mean, it, because I didn't go to high school in Napa, it was. It wasn't like I didn't know anybody there that, anymore. That makes you that. That so that was key. Yeah. I I mean not that like I didn't want to know people but um 
you know, it, you, you don't just kind of feel like you're falling into like the same old. No, thing. that's I agree because I was like, why don't I like living where I live? Because I live in the same town. I'm saying, but like literally, I'm like, I uh, it's so much nicer when you don't really know people from high school. Yeah. It's just a reminder. But anyway, yeah. I, I I was like, oh, that make that you didn't go to high school there, so yeah. you don't feel like, oh, you know, you don't feel like I dated the football player and, and you know, like yeah. that whole scenario. Of, yeah. Wow. No, so none of that, and and actually. Um, my now husband, we had been, you know, dating r- remotely to that point, and his he, he started <laughs> yeah, remotely. His first you're so you're still in pandemic mode. It yeah, was, yeah. Well, it was, it was long distance. Long you know? distance. There you go. Remote, <laughs> remote dating. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you guys were on Zoom. Like, well, dating. actually, back then it was Skype. Um, I I remember, remember that? Boom, yeah. boom, boom, boom. I remember exactly. the song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so um, and so he had never lived in Napa, um, and so we, with with the exception of like one person that we knew Mm -hmm. before but he only because our dads were friends um we didn't even know him that well um we all of our friends that we have now we made since we we moved there in 2008 so um yeah so it's i mean we we built a a nice really great community of people um your husband his name is jamie where is he from uh he is from whidbey island washington oh in the puget sound yeah so he's from a little island up yeah that's yeah so that talk about that's remote too, huh? Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> it's a tiny. It's a definitely a tiny little community. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How'd you guys meet? Um, well, so that's um, a fun story. My um, so his uh, family or his mother's from Portland, and so okay. um, and the, and his grandfather had um, had a beach house on the Oregon coast. Um, you know, like about two hours south of Portland. And um, and then my aunt and uncle bought a house there um, in the 90s, uh, and so d- down the street from my husband's um, family's home. And so um, I would go there in the summers with my mom, spend a couple weeks, go to theater camp <laughs> with my nice. with my cousin, mm-hmm. and um, and so our families have just known each other for decades, and we and we would see each other in the summers or over the holidays when we were there. Um, so, you know, through high school and college, we never saw each other because we weren't going and doing the family vacation thing. Um, but right after I graduated from college, actually, we went there for the holidays. And so my husband and I met after, you know, we hadn't seen each other maybe 10 years. So kind of met as adults, if you consider, you know, 21 and 22 year old adults. <laughs> and um, and so and then have been together since then. He was like, oh, clearly. You're like, oh, Jamie. <clears throat> Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, but that was when I was living in London, and he was going to law school in Sacramento. And so Skype, um, yeah. you know, texting yeah. was free, so that was good. And, um, uh, and yes, s- stayed in touch, obviously, and then until I moved back to San Francisco. Nice. So um, – what was it like? So you said you were the assistant to the national sales director. Mm-hmm. Um, what's it like working in a family business? Like, like, what would your dad like s- say things to you? You know, coach you, chide you? I don't know. Like, what's it like? What's it like? There was some weird stuff to navigate for sure. Um, I mean, it's not. It's it's not easy. Um, you know, um, well, you know, like, first of all, like, one of the first things is um, my boss was like, well, because I would refer to my dad as dad. Yeah. Because, you know, I was, you know, I like, that's, that's how I had always that, referred to that, him. You know, ever since I've been born. Yeah. And he was dad. like, you know, we really should, you really shouldn't, you really should call him Jason. And I was like, okay, yeah, okay, got it. And now I like, I can't stop calling him Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's not true. I, I can call him dead too. But um, so that, yeah, that was one little thing. You know, I think people definitely feel threatened and get, get their elbows out. And there can be some, you know, some nastiness that happens and that happened, you know, over the years. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all in all, um, worked with really great people. Um, and, um, you know, there's definitely that, that level of like not wanting to let your, you know, your dad down. Um, and you know, and having, and then also having that like extra, um, you know, just, yeah, not, not wanting to screw up, but then if you do screw up, you also hear it from him, (laughs) (laughs) right? Um, not just your boss or, you know, um, so there's that, so there's that too, but, you know, I was really fortunate to be able to, you know, like I mentioned before, I didn't, you know, 
do the business school route in yep. undergraduate, yep. but uh, worked with a lot of really incredible people. And um, you know, everything I know about the wine industry, I just I learned on the job. Nice. Um, you know, working with my dad, but you know, lots of different um, you know other people that have either been employees or consultants of the business over the years. Um, some really instrumental people. Um, yeah. yeah. So let's let's go back because you mentioned. Um, <clears throat> Randy Dunn was the first winemaker, and then Helen Turley took over at at uh, Paul Meyer. Yeah. Um, how much interaction did you did you ever have with uh, Helen? Um, I mean, I was. You were younger. You. Were younger. I was, you know, like eight years old, yeah. ten years old. Um, so, um, so yeah, so you know, I I told I remember her. I remember you know doing things with her and you know going to lunch or dinner or seeing her at the winery and things like that um but no not i mean did not really interact with her on a meaningful okay. level or anything super memorable <laughs> but i would ask you this as we look at the industry and it's changing and push for more inclusivity like you're actually a a, a woman in this business who saw a powerful woman in the business as mm -hmm. you know, do you i mean do you in retrospect, do you do you kind of what do you think about it now? Like, as you look back, like I asked you that question, like mm -hmm. advice for yourself, like if you look at that now, what what? Mm -hmm. How do you how 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 do you see that? Yeah, I mean, I, I at the time I definitely did not recognize right. see that for for what it is. You know, as a an innocent young yeah. <laughs> girl, not wise <laughs> to the the ways of the world. But you know, I looking back um, and. You know, knowing the experiences, you know, of of women that 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 have to work that much harder just to be able to get the job. I mean, at the time, I mean, when Helen and and I've um, heard other women speak about this, like Kathy Corson, yep. um, you know, they they would not give seller positions to women, period. Um, you know, and then uh, Kathy, one at one point, it was uh, she said she had a seller job, but then they would sabotage her like so they would like tighten like the the um the hatch of a of a tank so hard she couldn't open it and things like that so you know just to you know, the torque wrench <laughs> yeah. yeah you know it's uh people don't like change and um you know and it's and it's threatening when um when i guess there is change for certain people and so um i don't know i think it's uh it it's definitely sad that that it's that's still kind of a that's still an issue, and they still don't have representation, um, or at the same level as you know men in the industry. But um, uh, you know, it's getting better with every with everything, mm -hmm. and I think just setting up systems to give the same to give same you know opportunities to work up, and not just that, but just the same networking opportunities and like. You know how do you how do you like know people in the industry and um, you know like are you including women in your tasting groups things like things like that um, and you know that's like that's where a lot of people get started it's just in like a tasting group mm -hmm. um, and um, and so and so making it <laughs> like I remember my husband would always go to these tasting groups it's like always all men so it's like big boys night out and I went to a tasting group uh, with all women I was like oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> And it ended up just being like, just like a girl's night. Like people are drinking like cheap wine. Yeah, it ended up being no, like, like it ended up being like, like rosé all day, right, right, tasting? right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like we, you know. Anyway, so I got you. Um, yeah, so I think I think that there's still, um, you know, a lot of barriers in, in that way. Um, you know, not just for women, but also people of color in the industry. Um, but um, getting better. Nice. You know. I mean, because then you also, I mean, like, I, look, I'm looking back at your life and I'm not living your life, but then we're going to start talking about Wayfarer here. Um, I mean, you're around some badass women, Martine. So how did Wayfarer kind of come to be? I know it was it was kind of female driven. So your dad was telling people about Martine and then like Helen was instrumental in finding this property, correct? Yeah, yeah. So, well, yeah, my dad's first idea, he, he wanted to get into Pinot Noir. And so his first idea was to go to Burgundy and buy vineyards there and then have Helen, an American female, 
winemaker make the wines in um, in Burgundy. So, um, which was which is sad, but was incredibly radical at the time. I, I'm right? like when I read that, I was like, "Yo, that would have been sick, right? Yeah, to yeah. have her making the way she makes wines are really flavorful. If you never had." You know, mm-hmm. and and if you've had a Turley's Infidel, she only made that for one vintage, so <laughs> you probably never had a Hurl and Turley yeah, wine, yeah, right? Yeah, but exactly. if you had a Hell and Turley wine, um, you know, she's a very super talented winemaker, and so this was like the '90s, right? Yeah, so like, this is the like 90s. an American going over buying land in Burgundy, and then it's going to bring an American winemaker over mm-hmm. to make Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Mind blown. Yeah. Yeah. So, so any, uh, you know, my dad has, was the owner of two properties in Burgundy, two Grand Cru parcels for a very brief period of time. Mm. The French, uh, the local people appealed to an obscure real estate law that gave them first right of refusal on the transaction. And my dad got pushed out. And so, um, you know, at that point, the exchange rate, you know, going from dollars to to Frank's was very favorable, but going the other way around, he lost his, his shirt on the money being sent back, wired back, um, and um, but you know decided to, to you know to keep tr- to keep going, and so Helen had um, uh, recently at that time you know she's she became very famous for as being a cult Cabernet winemaker, yep. but it's probably now more famous for her own mm-hmm. um, little Pinot Noir. Chardonnay label Marcusan, and so she had recently uh, planted her vineyard um, in this region, and um, and uh, not too far from Marcusan was a property called Wayfair Farm. Um, it was owned just by this hippie couple that had moved out um, to this region as part of the Back to the Land movement, and they were growing fruits and vegetables, and they were running a small school. And um, was, it, was it a Warloff school? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very, I mean, very not w- not unlike I'm sure. But I don't think it was like any sort of official right. thing. But, but, but they were um, they were following the def- principles oh, yeah, of Rudolf they Steiner. Were, <laughs> they were raising uh, you know animals and farming and things like that. So, um, uh, and so, anyways, the property they had put it on the market, um, and um, and so she brought my dad out there. And um, my dad just fell in love with the with the place, and um, ended up buying the the parcel, and uh, planting the vineyard. Uh, finished planting it in two thousand two. And so, just so you guys know, like like these guys, uh, I think they were the Davises. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like we're talking organic bottom. They were selling their 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 produce to Chez Panisse. Like, yeah. so this is like. Like the first farm to table, yeah, restaurant. which is yeah. the first farm to table restaurant in America for sure, um, and but it also speaks to when you talk about terroir, like that that that's where that they were buying produce from that, yeah, lot. yeah, and so that's up near uh, Marcuson, right? Yeah, so it's in well now the region is known as um, Fort Ross Seaview AVA, which was approved. Just in 2012, mm. and then this just this year, the West Noma Coast AVA was approved. So, Fort Ross Seaview region is entirely within the new West Sonoma Coast region. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a little it can be a little confusing, but um, um, yeah. yeah. But basically, it just it just means that it's truly coastal because um, the Sonoma Coast AVA. Go it's this got, far it's got, inland. It, it's gotten watered down. Oh, totally. I mean, it was watered down from the very beginning, mm. right? You know, it was approved was it back in the 80s, maybe. And um, and it goes as far inland as, you know, the Sonoma part of Carneros. Um, and, you know, most of it isn't coastal at all. And so, um, and so the West Sonoma coast is carved out of truly coastal uh, influ- sites with truly coastal influence. And then Fort Ross Seaview in particular um, is pretty far north on the on the coast. Um, if you just if, from Healdsburg, if you just go straight west as the crow flies, that would be kind of, you that would be where Wayfair is. Um, but we're just four miles from the Pacific, um, so it's really close to the ocean. But then um, high elevation, so above the fog line, we're situated at twelve hundred feet. Um, but just to be in the Fort Ross Seaview AVA, you have to be above nine hundred nine hundred and twenty feet. Um, and so it's it's really dramatic, um, and beautiful region because 
So all the vineyards have to be at these high elevations. So they're all planted along the ridge lines and then surrounded by redwood forests, um, you know, with views of the of the Pacific in the distance. So it's a it's a really um, beautiful wine growing region. And <clears throat> there actually is a fort up there because <laughs> I went in a helicopter and I was like, holy. And literally we were flying over it and I was like, is that a fort? And the pile's like, uh, he's and see, he's like Fort. I like Fort Ross. He's like, holy shit, that yeah. there's an actual fort there. Yeah, because it's on like a cliff or a bluff, and you would have a fort so you could see ships coming yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. Um, how that seems very close to the Pacific Ocean. It's got to be one of the closest. Like four miles. It's very close. Yeah. Um. Is that? I mean, how? That's a very like that's one of the closest to the Pacific. It's got to be right. I mean, I that's actually a good question. Um, but I, I, I would imagine yeah, so. I, I think that's pretty damn close. Yeah, and some vineyards in this region are just um, like two miles or less than two miles yeah. from the from the coast. So we're a little bit further inland. And I want to say, wasn't Joseph Phelps like a pioneer out there with the freestone? Like, there's some um, couple people. So yeah. So Joseph Phelps um, had their has their freestone yep. um, uh, brand, um, but pioneers would be um, well Helen Turley, but um, before that David Hirsch was out there. Uh, f- the flowers, okay, uh, flowers or, yeah. or Walt and yep. Joan Flowers, yep. um, which is now um, owned by um, Huneus uh, yeah. Vintners, um, and then well Peter Michael planted vineyard out there around the same time we did, um, and. Yeah. So, um, so, but, but it's a and, and Steve Kissler's out there now too, right? Yes, Oxidental. Yeah, which is a little further a little south. Further, so, yeah, yeah. all part of the West Sonoma Coast. But Got it. Uh, yeah, they're in Occidental area. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, like, you, I mean, I, I, like, I feel bad. Like, I mean, Marcus Sanis, it's like almost unattainable. But it's, I've been fortunate to have it, and it is, it's like a whole. And these wines, like the reason why this is such a, these are wines are a whole nother level of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, just 100%, you know? Um, so, like, have you talked to your dad about this? Like, cause he, you know, he was gonna make a Mouton and then all of a sudden he fell in love with Burgundy. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, I mean, he always says, I mean, so he started out in wine, you know, like loving the big um, Australian Shiraz and, then you know the wines of Bordeaux, um, but he al- he always says that every enophile eventually gravitates to the wines of Burgundy because, I mean, they're just so versatile. They're so they have so much life and energy, and just um, and they're just so interesting um, and enjo- enjoy enjoyable to drink. And so um, I've th- I've certainly found that true for myself as well. Um, and um, yeah, and and so so when we. Um, so he planted the the vineyard, and then, um, but then we weren't. He, we were bottling the the fruit under the Palmyre label okay. for for a few years, mm-hmm. blending it with um, with some other vineyards from Russian River Valley, um, you know. But but with but with Chardonnays and Pinot Noirs in particular, um, you know, they're the great Chardonnays and Pinot Noirs of the world don't come from a blend of this vineyard, that vineyard. They come from just one really special site or even just little pieces of that really special right. vineyard. Right. And so um, so when I started working with my dad in 2008 um, and I got started to get to know Wayfair much better, not, it's not, it wasn't just the place that we would go. Sometimes it took two and a half hours <laughs> to drive to, you know, um, it, it was, uh, I started to get to know the wines and the wine business. And so um, I got to create this label, mm-hmm. um, with the you know with the rest of the with the, our team at the time of course, um, in with the in 2012. So okay. we, and so that in 2012 we harvested our first fruit that would be the the Wayfair um, estate label. And so, um, like, what's the mm, like you said? Every uh, all true enophiles gravitate towards the wines of Burgundy. Um, what was it like kind of making this its own? Like, because it was under Paul Meyer, which is known, mm-hmm. iconic brand. Mm-hmm. Um, and you helped design this, but like, ha- 
was it? What did you, did, did you go say, hey, Dad? Did you say, hey, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, this, these, you know, uh, if you look at Burgundy, it is. It's all about villages, and it comes down to even blocks, like you said. Like you know, um, how did you guys come to the, the realization that this should be a standalone brand? Yeah. Well, I think. I mean, well, it, the, the, because the vineyard was was really at that point, the vineyard was um, ten years old. Okay. And so it was really. Um, kind of an ideal way to start, you know, an, a, a label or a wine brand that's just from just one single property, mm -hmm. and so um, and so the so the vineyard really drove that, and then as far as you know, like Paul Meyer and and, sep and differentiating it from Paul Meyer, um, that was really also the key is that it was really had to do with um, just this one truly special place. And um, and that's what we wanted to showcase with those wines. Um, I think with and, and I think that that's a unique thing to Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, because <clears throat> with you know with Paul Meyer, over the years we had been was you know changing our food sources from time to time, but mm -hmm. we, we were still making Paul Meyer wines year after year. Um, but Wayfair wines can only come from one place. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, Who's 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 who, who's making the wines for you guys now? So um, Todd Cohn is our winemaker. Um, he and I have been working together for almost ten years, uh, which is something I'm really proud of to have that um, that type of longevity and consistency. Um, another one of my colleagues, also we've been working together for almost ten years. Both of them um, worked with me at Paul Meyer. Okay. Um, and um, and so yeah, so Todd um, is from um, Northern California, from Reading area, and um, he decided not to go into his family business. His family business, his dad, um, uh, basically, it, it's like um, so like supply chain for like frozen goods. <laughs> um, so unlike his brother and sister, he decided he he, he wanted to um, to make wine, and so he went to UC Davis. Um, he uh, did he worked at Schramsberg, um, and then um, Opus One, um, and at Opus One, that's when he really got into um, the viticulture side of it. Because uh, Michael Salacci always, w w one of his philosophies was that if you work in the winery, you have to work in the vineyard. If you work mm -hmm. in the vineyard, you have to work in the winery. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so when we were uh, looking for someone to hire for Wayfair, uh, at that point we were hiring for an assistant winemaker. Our first winemaker for Wayfair uh, was Bibiana Gonzalez Rave. She's a Colombian <laughs> um, and made the wines for several years before mm -hmm. Todd took over. Um, uh, but anyways, it, well, so what really what really attracted us to him was his that he had that skill set and that desire to work both in the vineyard and the winery. Mm -hmm. um, so um, and so he's just he's incredibly talented, focused uh, young man. Yes. Younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, yeah. And so he spends, um, you know, a good chunk of his time. In, in the vineyard, well, and driving 90 minutes each way because mm -hmm. he, he lives closer than I do. He lives in Santa Rosa, but, um, and then, yeah, so he's been, so he's been making the, he's took over as winemaker um, in 2017. Okay. So 2017 was also the year you became, what did you become? What did I say? President. I started running Paul Meyer. Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, did you, succeed your dad was he running it at that point well or? well actually we had um a president uh okay. that my dad had hired he my dad really wanted to retire yeah um and so when when i realized that this had be become you know his plan or this was his that that's actually what drove a big uh that's that's really what drove me to start working with him mm -hmm. because i just i i knew that if you had um you know family business um with you know, a single person at the helm all, all these years, and then that goes away. The what the the business and and the and what you're making, which is which is the most important thing, is the product in the wine business. It it'll, it loses its reason for being. It loses its soul. You lose that mm -hmm. that um, what makes it great. Mm. And so and so I wanted to be able to carry that on. Um, and so um, so, but between my dad. And me, um, 
we had um, a president that was running the business for, I think, five or seven years. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, and you have two siblings? Uh, two brothers. Um, one is just a year younger than me, um, and he's actually been living here for more than 10 years, I think. And then my other brother is in college. <laughs> well, okay. Um, neither of them have any interest in coming into the business with you at some point? Or? Perhaps my younger brother okay. someday, but um, but that remains to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> he has worked a harvest, <laughs> and he did a great job. <laughs> um, and how is your, uh, your husband involved in all this? Yeah, so he, um, so he's a lawyer. I mentioned um, yep. we met when he was in law school, um, and he actually he does um, estate planning um, in in Napa Valley. So you know he ends up working with a lot of wineries and things like that. But he really caught the wine bug when he met me, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and then just kind of similar to my dad, just became a a self taught like student of wine, um, and so in addition to his um, law practice, he actually also started a wine brand, um, with D Wade. Um, and so he was my husband and, and, and my dad. So a partnership between. Oh, so he's Wade. part of three by Wade. Yeah. That's why it's three by Wade. Yeah. Yeah. See? So yeah. <laughs> All y'all just like me thought it was cause Dwayne Wade was, he shoots the three. Well, no, well it is, it is. I mean, it's a double, it's a number. double entendre. It's a, it's actually, a triple. that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Well, my husband's kind of the silent one behind yep. the scenes that really put it all together. And you know, for ah. several years, he was the one, if you emailed the winery, he was answering your emails. Okay. He was, you know, doing the, the bookkeeping. He was like, you know, blending the wines with the winemaker. Like he's really super to that. So very proud of him, what he's accomplished in that. But, um, you know, but as far as his contribution with Wayfair, I mean, he's, uh, I mean, he's just an incredibly supportive and um, husband and talented individual. And so um, I rely on him a lot. So that's why you married him. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> uh, this is not even my notes. I didn't even, I, I literally, like I said, these are so casual. But now, um, so your husband put that together. So how did your husband, obviously it's easy, your father-in-law, fucking Jason Palmer. Yeah. But like, <laughs> did how do you meet D Wade? How did how did that come together? Like, was he did he hear D Wade was list was looking? Like, it was it, it was this somehow he got invited. I'm I, I'm not gonna try to tell the story because I'm gonna screw it up. Somehow he got invited to go to dinner in L A with Dwayne okay. and Dwayne's manager, you know, business yep. people behind mm-hmm, him, and mm-hmm. and something that unique about Dwayne is just how he's. Or like how, how he conducts himself in business and how he's able to have this incredible career mm-hmm. after um, the NBA, and that's 100 percent because of Dwayne and his work ethic. And you know he gets he gets involved in projects that he's truly passionate about. Truly passionate mm-hmm. about. And mm-hmm. So um, yeah, so Dwayne was uh, interested in getting into wine, and you know I guess my husband had the right invitation at the right time, and um, and uh, that, and that's kind of, that's how it started. Okay. Yeah. So it's they met each other and they, yeah, they, they hit it off. They hit it off. So, um, because you know, I won't see every celebrity, but a lot of celebrities are like, oh, I'm gonna have a wine, and it literally is just finding some bulk wine, getting a yeah, label. Yeah. Like, okay, how many appearances do I have to make? Yeah. You know, yeah. like how many photo shoots do I have to do, and then that's it. Right. Yeah. But no, Dwayne's um, re- he's he's really involved, and his his team's involved, and it's um. Uh, yeah, so it's been uh, it's I mean they're 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 having a, a lot of success. I'm really, really yeah. proud of them. And I was like, when I heard he was you know he was rocking with Jason Paul, I was like, oh, he's serious. Like he's <laughs> you know he's serious about making a wine. Yeah. Um, and then like the white's like a Chenin Blanc blend, which I find very I love Chenin Blanc, but I think that's very interesting. Do you, why did that? What was that decision? Was just there was a Chenin Blanc laying around. We didn't want they wanted to do something different. They I'm, wanted to do something different. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna have to have them on the I know. Well, on the no. pot. No, no, no. I'm happy to. I just don't want to. Yeah, know, no. I, I'll mess get the story. But no, they, I don't, they definitely wanted to do something different. Yeah. And the the Chenin is um is a uh, you know it's a it's, they found some fruit that was really good and they decided to to do that no the team at d-wade's pretty cool they've been following the black wine guy i yeah. messaged them i i about having Dwayne on and i told him i'd rather do it live than remote yeah, um, yeah. so we're, we're gonna make that happen but i love that this is what happens on this podcast i was saying like like 
you, I like everybody kind of knows each other once you get to a certain yeah. level of like you know like the only one in the NBA like once you're in the NBA you're gonna know you're gonna you know like, yeah. you're gonna kind of know everybody. Well, the person that knows everybody is my husband. <laughs> yeah, clearly, man. Yeah. Um, yes. But um, like, that's just his personality. He's just he's out there. That's supersonic. You know, no, getting to know people. Um, but like you said, because um, it's even in your bio, like um, it alludes. That's why I asked. It alludes to like his passion for wine. Mm-hmm. Um, but that you know, I, I also just. Do you feel like you married your dad on one level? Like he's a lawyer. <laughs> like you, you had to say yourself. You know, like, how did that happen? It wasn't until <clears throat> like like a couple years ago that I I was talking to. I forget how it came up, but I was like, holy shit, I did. <laughs> Marry my dad. They are so freaking similar. <laughs> and they get along amazingly well. It was actually really funny when my husband was in law school, like right after we had started dating, he um, he needed a summer, in- summer internship mm-hmm. and spent the summer living with my dad and my stepmother and my little brother, because my little brother was still at home then, um, and, um, and then working at a law firm interning at a law firm in Napa, but living with my dad all summer. And it's like, <laughs> here he is, the boyfriend just like moves in right, with right. the, you He's know. He's got the father's approval. With the like, girlfriend's uh, how, family. How do I dump this guy now? Right? Oh yeah, he and my dad, <laughs> but they have the same energy. Like yep. they're both up in the morning, have an espresso together, <laughs> you know, just like, yeah, they have, they, 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 they vibrate on the same frequency. <laughs> That's so cool. That's so cool. So as, as president of uh, Paul Meyer, um, by the way, Paul Meyer Merlot is fucking delicious. Thank you. <laughs> uh, last guest you met, uh, we, we we just, she's, I'm, she's making Merlot, but we were just saying how Merlot is so maligned and like, but when it's done right, oh my God. So I just always remember, like, I'm sure, I remember the, the it was like a teal blue label. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the old label. The old label, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm so holding good. you. Yeah, it's so, so good. good. Yeah. And then, um, still so you, good. Yeah. I haven't had it in a minute. Um, I need to get some. So you have, you have Paul Meyer, and then you have the second label there is Jason, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so you're running Paul Meyer, Jason, and it's just the two labels there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and then and then and then we started Wayfair. And then you started Wayfair, mm-hmm. and so you, you have two la- two 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 uh, labels over there now. Um, out of all that, because you come from a Bordeaux varietal kind of background, um, not you, but you know what I mean, the the winery. Um, why are you so passionate about Wayfair? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think, I mean, it's definitely being able to create it um, from the ground up is um, w- was really was really incredible, um, and being able to have this site that just has this just soul, this just feeling to it. And um, and to be able to make wines from that and share them with people, I mean that's that's been um, really really amazing. So I mean I'm incredibly lucky to be able to like have that jumping off point um, for making this. But then I'm also you know continuing what my dad started, um, and so and so there's kind of like that that legacy piece there, which is really meaningful to me as well. How do you feel? that we probably talk about that art history and that 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 background and, and curation how do you think that plays into what you do uh, with the the wines you're making um, I mean I think that I think that it's it's similar in that we're really trying to, do everything at the highest level, like mm-hmm. every single detail, you know. And when you when you have, you know, you look at a piece of art in a museum, it's it's in the museum because it's an you know it's an incredible work of art, and um, and so to be able to to bring that that level and that focus, you know, every year when we're creating a new a new vintage, a new wine. Um, you know, and from, from what we do in the vineyard and with the wines, then to also how we go to market and how do we present ourselves um, is, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like a, an, in, my inclination is to be a perfectionist, you know, okay. and so, and so to, it's, so it's like the perfect, you know, 
thing for me to do is to try to try to achieve that perfection every year. Um, you know, every year is going to be different. There's and there's also, um, also, you know, we're never finished either. Mm. You know, like vintage after vintage. I'm always asking, like, how can we make this better? How can we, you know, what can we do differently? Um, and and then because because the you know the world is not a static place, tastes are not a static place. You know the different technologies are you know ways of doing things that are not static, and so to continue improving um, is also really important. And so, as the president, um, how involved are you? Like, do you go out and taste the blends? I mean, like, I mean, do you do, you, do you, I mean, is there a committee? I think so a lot of places there's a committee, and, mm -hmm. and you, are you involved at that level mm -hmm. as well? Oh yeah, I mean, so. I don't make the wine, but I do, you know, everything else is, or touch everything else as yeah. far as business goes. And so, um, but, but, you know, especially with Paul Meyer, um, you know, being so, such a, you know, so much bigger than Wayfair, you know, every, every year sitting around, sitting with the winemaker and putting together the blends, it was, you know, it, it's, it was always, um, a major because uh, you, you you have to weigh the financial implications of what you're mm -hmm. deciding, but then also with protecting the brand and what should be in the bottle. Um, but with Wayfair, we try to keep it just really small and focused. I think if you have too many people in the room, you end up too many voices end up losing what it's it too many what it should be. <laughs> yeah, and so you know, so but with Wayfair, we have a really tight team. Um, just well, usually my husband's there too, and me, and then our national sales manager, um, and and Todd, who I'm working with both of them for mm -hmm. ten years, and so, um, and really respect everyone's palate, um, and so, you know, it, it's funny though, because Todd will put together at least two different options for for each wine, for each wine that we make, um, and inevitably will be split. Like, so there's four of us. We split, you know, half of us prefer one over the other and vice versa. And, um, but Todd, and, and so I'm going like, ah, oh, cause you know, like you can drive yourself nuts with, with these decisions. Cause you, you know, you, you, I mean, you know, you put wine in the glass, you sm smell, smell mm -hmm. it, you taste it, come back to it an hour later, completely, it's completely changed on you, you know? And so, you know, that's where yeah, you're like, the, either like. Hello, or like, where the fuck did you go? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and so, and so, uh, but Todd actually absolutely loves it when when we're when we're split because you know he he have it because the fact, not the fact that one is going to win out of the other, but that what we're saying about the wines helps. Because he him put get them to together, right? Yeah, because yeah. he's like, oh, okay, yeah. You like that? They yeah. like that? Like, okay, they're both. You know, both yeah. are good at this point. So you know, it? ultimately, yeah. like, I I do not believe in. Lead or leading by micromanaging. I mean, and and I also value very highly that um, that I have or that I've gotten to a level with the people I work with that there is such a great degree of trust. And so um, and so essentially, the way it goes is we taste it. We love, you know, we generally love both the wines, um, you know, both the different options. Talk about it, and then Todd basically then just goes back and then does his thing with with all of our feedback but um you know sometimes I, i'll much more strongly be like no 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 we need to go in this direction um uh but um but usually if, you know I, I leave it to to todd yeah <laughs> <laughs> but that's always you know a really important a really important um uh you know decision what are you, you going to put in the bottle every year so yeah yeah I, I absolutely absolutely um Where do you where do you see this? Like you said, it's a very focused brand. It's very mm -hmm. place driven. Like kind of like what's the production on these? I know you have the second label helps you a little bit because it's mm -hmm. instead of declassifying it per se, you 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 you're using it. But yeah, I mean, so we make less than five thousand cases. Okay, we have um, so we're just thirty acres. Yeah, and so what I see for or my vision for Wayfair is is not to not to grow, mm -hmm. to, to stay really focused in what we're doing. So everything coming from our one site. Um, but we want to be recognized as a Grand Cru of California. Um, 
and you know we were we've gotten some wonderful accolades that's really wonderful um uh one writer even you know said that we were a grand crew of california but you know i i think that we have a lot of work to do because i think that um you know we're, we can continue um to work on our craft but then also continue to work on um on how we farm the land are we doing what's best you know for the for the land are how are we um you know constantly you know improving and how we're doing things um to, to be sustainable and um and you know conscious of the earth um and then and then as far as the 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 brand in recognition of the brand just to continue to um build the reputation and build the you know the 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 quality of the wine so that we can achieve that that status with our peers and our customers and that that's ultimately so so just so to to focus on this this one um this one really special place and make nice. incredible wines. You know, when we were warming up, I asked you some questions about like what's your favorite meal, such and so on. Um, what are some of the wines that you drink, maybe from regions, you know, to say people are like, um, cause you could like, you know, you could get high on your own supply and you should be doing really well here with all this I make, but like, like do, where, do, what regions do you like uh, when you're enjoying wine with your husband? You guys yeah. like, Tuscany I mean where, where, where you know just what do you guys like yeah yeah no I mean we love um so I mean we we love drinking California Pinot Noirs um but so do I. yeah <laughs> but um but of course and, and Chardonnay though I have to say um Chardonnay is definitely one of my favorite <laughs> when, wine I mean, bridles when in it's, the world when it, yeah. the way the way it's made when it's made right that's why it's so good I know I always say it's a really expensive habit though because like I'll never ever order like a buy the glass Chardonnay offering because bad Chardonnay or sorry inexpensive Chardonnay or bad Chardonnay is. I was gonna say inexpensive Chardonnay, Chardonnay is usually bad Chardonnay. It's usually I hate bad to be that Chardonnay, guy, exactly. But, but and let's so keep and, it one hundred. Well, you know, a lot of times people bulk it, paying you know ninety dollars a bottle for you know a retail price for a white wine or for Chardonnay, and I'm just and I'm like you know. It's an expensive habit, and the and the people. wines have so much to offer. Yep. You know, you're you know. Anyways, um, so love. I mean, so I uh, I love drinking. We also really love Oregon wines. You okay. know, like we I mentioned, yeah. we have the connection. We 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 met in, in Oregon, yep. um, and so we love going up to there to to the the beach where we met, and then also exploring uh, Willamette Valley. Um, some really exciting producers there, especially with Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. um, I think the whites coming out of the white wine and the sparkling wines mm -hmm. coming out of Oregon are going to be better than the Pinots. You heard it here first. Mm -hmm. I could be mm -hmm. wrong, but I really have yeah. been so impressed well, by I think, the Chardonnays. Oh, a hundred percent. But I mean, I think I think both Chardonnays and the Pinot Noirs are going to continue to get better, though, because I mean, think about how young of a wine growing region. Oh, uh, I remember. Oregon I'm is. 54. I remember, like, in 97, I got the wine, but it was like, Oregon, up wines from Oregon sucked in 97, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, it, But it's, now the vines are older, and you're just getting these fruit, you know, like I had my last 13% alcohol, but the ripeness, the richness of the fruit, because mm -hmm. um, she was explaining, because the, the days are longer, but, mm -hmm. but, like, the maturity now, now I get it. Yeah. But the white wines have come full circle there. Yeah. I mean, viticulture takes time like it takes time to know mm. like what the right rootstocks are what the best clonal selections are what to plant where you know burgundy's had thousands and thousands of years um in italy and in bordeaux mm -hmm. and um and you know in in california we we have more time under our belts and things like that but you know just in time for you know climate to be throwing another exactly. <laughs> <laughs> curveball, curveball at, us. at us but um but yeah i mean my uh we also love drinking um burgundy Definitely white burgundy. Yeah. <laughs> um, white burgundy is sick. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Every time I like, like every time I, I'm like, oh, you just like once you have you're like, ah, oh, you get what the fuss is about. Yeah, yeah. Like you don't want to admit yeah. it, but like you, you like, you're like, you really get what yeah. the fuss is about. Yeah. We're white burgundy. Like, yeah. oh. Um, and then we also love drinking um, Italian wines too, like Barolo, Barolo and Abiolo and um, mm. Super Tuscans, and so yeah, yeah. Right. Well, cool. We're gonna play a fun little game. Okay. It's called FMK. Fuck, marry, kill. Okay. <laughs> Three grapes. <laughs> you get to fuck one, you get to marry one, and you have to get rid of one. You have to kill one. Okay. 
All right, so here we go. I'm going to make this easier for you, or maybe not. Um, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Merlot. Ooh, you just made it hard. Yeah, that's why I didn't, I didn't, I I didn't even go cab. because you would. Ca- yeah, ca- like, <laughs> oh, you just, you just got me. Okay, well, I am an unabashed lover of Chardonnay. Um, I don't care what, you know, the ABC people, you know, yeah. say. It's so fuck Chardonnay. Yeah. 100%. Um, gosh. Well, I mean, this is a super hard one. Um, but I'm, you know, I, I'm going to have to marry Pinot Noir and s- sadly kill Merlot. Um, Way to stay on brand. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> we are yeah. talking about way yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> but I need to see that Paul Melissa looks like, oh. I know. I know. All right. That was fun. Um, all right. So last question for you, Cleo. What are you most excited for in the future? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I'm. So we, uh, I'm really excited just to continue focusing in on Wayfair. Um, at the end of 2019, we sold um, Paul Meyer, and so, uh, but but got kept Wayfair. And so, in 2020, established it as its own standalone brand, That's working awesome. with a you know small team of people that I absolutely love, and um, and so I'm just really excited to continue focusing in on just these, um, you know. 30 incredible acres, um, making these beautiful wines, sharing them with people, um, and just continuing to improve everything that we're doing. Um, you know, with all the shit that's happening in our world, thank God for wine. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, to, to be able to, to do something that just brings so much joy um, is, is a blessing. Well, there it is, everybody. Cleo, thank you so much for coming on. I'm glad we were able to do this. Uh, tell people where they can find you, how they can be a part of what you're doing. Um, so it's a uh, website is wayfarevineyard.com. Um, you can join our mailing list, order our wines, um, and um, reach out to us. We'd love to host you if you're ever in the Napa or Sonoma area. Awesome. And for all you listeners out there, don't forget to check out the show notes for each episode. That's where you'll find info on the wines we drank uh links to cool stuff i'll put the website in there i'll put some social handles uh, and so much more uh until the next time cheers to the mavericks the philosophers the deep thinkers and all you wine drinkers peace